A quick reminder before we get into this video that tickets are still available for the Aldas and Tomo live show on Friday the 4th of August in London. We've recently announced some of the guests who will be joining us on stage, which will include Matt and Tommy from P1, Katie Fairman, and also Dan and Blake from the Engine Breaking Podcast. For more information about the night and also to buy tickets, check out the link at the very top of the description and I hope to see you there. Alex Albon has been driving out of his skin over the past few races. Since his comeback last season, he's firmly established himself as not only one of the best drivers in the midfield, but also the driver Williams are hoping to build around for the future, akin to the likes of Leclerc at Ferrari or Norris at McLaren. It's easy to forget just how badly his time with Red Bull ended and also how close he was to genuinely falling out of F1 forever. But at the same time, I think the way that he's re-established himself on the grid and the way that he's rebuilt his reputation, that is why I think his time with Red Bull has almost been forgotten now and if anything, seems like an anomaly given what he did before and since. It's not easy to recover from the Red Bull second driver curse, but Alex Albon has truly gone from being yet another Red Bull reject to the future of the Williams team. Alex's career started off with a bang. He was immediately impressive in his Toro Rosso debut with some stunning drives like in China going from the pit lane to P10, and when Red Bull did decide to drop Gasly midway through 2019 and promote Albon, I think Alex did a really good job in the second half of the year given that he was a rookie and that he was also stepping into a situation where the previous driver had just lost his seat due to underperforming. But as good as his rookie season was when you combine his time at Toro Rosso and Red Bull, 2020 was a struggle from the off. He had that famous collision with Lewis in the opening race where potentially had he passed him there could have been a chance to win the race. But despite that setback he just never really managed to recover. In what was the second best car that year, Alex finished 7th in the championship, scoring just two podiums in Mugello and Bahrain, with Max in 3rd scoring more than double the points. At the time, the big talking point was all about the handling characteristics of that era of Red Bull. They were twitchy and pointy cars at the nose which required supreme confidence during the braking and turning phase and then also a lot of confidence to be able to live with the instability at the rear. Looking back even to this day, after three drivers in three years, Max was still the only one that could really ever get on top of those cars. In terms of why Alex struggled as much as he did, it's something that he talked about quite openly on his return in 2022. Everything takes time. Although I wasn't in Formula 1 last year, I feel better prepared now than I did at the end of 2020. I wouldn't say something went wrong, that would be an exaggeration. It was the experience that was missing. And when I say experience, it's not just about the driving itself. If you look at the gaps between Checo and Max, at the beginning of last year, it was no different to me. I took a lot of criticism for my performance. That's when the 2021 break came in handy. When you're not driving yourself, you can take a step back and suddenly see the whole picture. I realized how important it is to get everything out of the car. Sometimes you don't feel comfortable with a setup, but it's still the best setup. I had to understand that first. I think overall for Alex, it was just too fast too soon. After his strong end to 2019 when the expectations were kind of low off the back of what Gasly did, going into 2020 those expectations were always going to be higher for Alex to naturally improve and build on 2019 to potentially become the team's long-term option. But those early season results which slipped away for one reason or another seemed to just really knock him off his balance. After that, I just don't think he had the experience or mental toughness at the time to really deal with that sort of pressure. And then when you throw into the equation the need to drive a tricky car that requires confidence by a driver who's clearly lacking it, for Albon the writing was on the wall towards the end of the year. The fact that you also had a driver like Checo who was now a race winner in 2020 sitting on the sidelines made the case to keep Alex even weaker. The announcement that Alex would be dropped came too late in 2020 for him to be able to find another seat 
but he took it on the chin and embraced sitting out 2021 still as a Red Bull test and reserve driver. Since returning in 2022, when you take into account the cars that he's been driving, I think when the car has allowed him to, he has been able to show the same qualities that made Red Bull put him in that top team in the first place. Even though the Williams as of recent has had a surge in performance, on balance over the last two years it has still been the worst car on the grid. But having said that, we have seen that on tracks where downforce is not as much of a factor and where straight line speed is really important, it can still be a car capable of scoring points. When those opportunities have arisen, I think Alex has done a really good job to capitalize on them. Sometimes he's been able to score points through pure performance of qualifying well and then having a really good race like Silverstone last time out, and then sometimes when the raw pace hasn't quite been enough, he has still been able to make an alternative strategy work, like in Australia in 2022 where he took his tyres all the way to the end to still score a single point. Even in Canada this season, which was a track that the team knew would suit them, Alex delivered a stunning P7 performance on a weekend where the team brought just one set of new upgrades for Alex only. This meant that not only did he have the pressure of delivering a result to justify the brand new upgrades, but he also had the added pressure of not making a mistake all weekend and damaging the only set of new upgrades that the team had. It shows that even though the car doesn't have a wide operating window, Alex certainly does. He can score points in different ways and even when the team targets or one specific race in which they know that they can do well at, Alex has the speed and the composure to seize those opportunities. Returning to Williams, even though they haven't had a competitive car, has been the best thing for Alex because, to put it simply, the Williams environment has put Alex in the best place mentally to get the most out of his talent. Leaving Red Bull, he talked about lacking confidence, lacking experience, and not knowing how to best deal with pressure. And I think being the number one driver at Williams, having the entire team around him, has allowed him to regain that confidence mentally and belief in his own abilities. A huge amount of credit has got to go to the Williams organization and it's no surprise that now that they're starting to address the issues that held them back for so many years and are now also starting to slowly plan and develop for the future, they see Alex as their marquee driver who, if they can give him a good enough car, he can go out there and deliver the results. I think most teams are trying to build around what Zach Brown has described in the past as a franchise driver, not just a driver who can deliver on the track but also a driver who can represent the brand and cultivate a new fan base for the team. In the context of Alex Albon, a few weeks ago I got the chance to visit the Williams pop-up store in London prior to the British Grand Prix where he made an appearance and you really get the sense when you're there that not only is he important for the team on track, but he also represents the future of a new generation of Williams fans in Formula 1. Having said that, judging how good Alex has been and where he ranks amongst the other drivers is not exactly easy. When it comes to his teammates, in 2022 he dominated Latifi as he should have, and now in 2023 up against a rookie Logan Sargent, he's once again dominating him. Those are not great benchmark drivers to say the least. So at the moment, he's kind of this unknown to an extent. In terms of the eye test, to me at least, he looks like one of the best drivers in the midfield. I don't think it's crazy to mention him with the likes of Bottas, Gasly, or even Ocon if you're really pushing it. But until he actually beats anyone of any real quality, or gets a car genuinely comparable to compete at the top of the midfield, it's still hard to say how good he really is. In the end, all he can focus on is what Williams puts in front of him, and I think, looking at the recent surge in performance that the Williams has had, I think it will be very exciting to see him in more regular contention for the points. Or what Albon has done after being rejected by Red Bull, I think is seriously impressive. He bided his time and went to the right team and the right environment to rebuild his stock, even if the car wasn't necessarily the best. As I mentioned earlier, not only do I think that he's re-established himself, 
but I also wouldn't be surprised if other teams started to take an interest in him for the future. If there was an opportunity on the table, or would he consider leaving the team that is now built around him for a team further up the grid where there are more questions and potentially more unknowns? Well, I guess I'll leave that question to you. Well, there you have it. Once again, don't forget to check out the link at the very top of the description for more details and tickets to the Aldas and Tomo live show on Friday the 4th of August. And if you did enjoy this video, then don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.